On Captain Cook's voyage, he and his um, doctor scribe, the journal says, we have found quite a number of sugarcane patches above you know, Kona, and it is some of the largest, best specimens of sugarcane we have seen, and it makes a rather fine beer. So we know what the value of that was to those sailors. Welcome to What Would Our Kupuna Do? This is Richard Haas blog, which looks at what we can do today to make Hawaii Island a more sustainable place to live. The goal is that our children and grandchildren and their grandchildren won't be priced out of here and will be able to stay in Hawaii and live good lives here. I am Leslie Lang, and today Richard and I are joined by John Cross. Hi, Richard, and hi, John. Hello. Hi, Leslie. How's it, John? Hey, good to be on. John has been working in Hawaiian agriculture for more than 50 years. And if you are interested in learning more about anything we're talking about today, he has a really interesting website full of a lot of interesting information at depth. It's at pu'ueo.com slash john hyphen cross. And I'll put that link in the description box below. It's really worth a look. So today we are talking about Hawaii Island's sugar plantations, their history, and then what comes next. I thought we would start with a little bit of background and talk just briefly about canoe plants because that's really what led to all of this. It's always been fascinating to me about what crops and plants made it to Hawaii only by the act of man and by the Polynesian settlers, that they brought it here from the Marquesas or Kahiki, it was called, and bananas, uh, how, uh, even coconut. You would think that coconut would have floated here, but rarely. All sorts of other crops, uh, ava, taro, uh, sugar cane. They could not have gotten here any other way except in a canoe. And so they're called canoe plants. And there are quite a few different varieties of these plants that came from the south. I was thinking that if I was traveling 2,000 miles, away from home. I would want to take the best of what I have from my homeland and bring it to this new land to the north. So Hawaii ended up with some of the best that the Marquesas and Society Islands could um, produce. That's a great point, because I guess these canoe plants were both to sustain them on this long voyage across the ocean to find a new island home, and then also to plant. They were planning ahead. We need to be able to set up a society that supports us. So they brought the things that were important to them. Super interesting. And as I was thinking about this, Richard, I was thinking about how mai'a or bananas, which are sort of your bailiwick all these years, were one of the canoe plants. So you really took that and ran with it. Good for you. <laughs> you know, and what John said that really hit the point was that if you had a choice and you're going to come up in a canoe, wouldn't you bring the best you had? And that's the bottom line, yeah? You know, yep. you, you know Richard, um, I was working at that zip line up north of me, yeah, the Uma Uma Falls zip line, mm -hmm. and, and I found a flume trail. And so the boys and I, we cut along this flume trail that went to an intake on the Uma Uma River. Beautiful intake, all made of native stone. It was called Stone Dam Number 42. Along the way, I came across a big patch of banana. I think it was Frank Truesdell was with me from USGS, and he says, John, that's an Iholena. And the Iholena banana went straight out, you know, from the stalk. And on the inside, it was salmon colored pink. And I learned later that the Iholena was the only banana that women could eat. All the other banana varieties were banned from from uh, wahini eating them, only the ihorema. So sugarcane or ko was one of these um, canoe plants. And they, of course, took on great importance here because it led to the sugar plantation era. Back in the 1830s and 40s, and this was specific to the area of Hilo, and Governor Kuakini brought Chinese sugar masters from China to help develop the sugarcane industry. So the Chinese, as immigrant laborers, didn't arrive until 1850. But Tong Si's, the Chinese sugar masters, did. They were recruited. The Chinese sugar masters, the, the Tong Si's, knew how to boil down cane juice and crystallize it. This was an art, an art that was kept secret. It was, it was a a craft that they did not share with others. In fact, there are written accounts where the Tong Si's, if they found out that another one of them shared the secret, 
of how to make crystallized sugar with the businessmen of, from America, they would be fined $500. Now, let me tell you, in 1840, uh, $500 is like half a million. <laughs> Wow, that's so interesting. It was a, a technique, you know, to get crystallized sugar. Otherwise, all you got was sweet syrup. You know, John, can you uh, describe Ico and the origin of that name? And we're going back to the Tong Seas and uh, the Chinese sugar masters. There were quite a few of them that were brought over by Governor Kuokini very early on in the sugar industry because they knew they could grow good cane and they just didn't know how to process it into crystallized sugar. So one of the men, uh, the Tongsis, was Lung Zhou, and he started up in Pohala, and then he moved up his plantation, another plantation, to Lihui. Now, you might think, Lihui Kauai? No, in Waimea at the Lalamilo homesteads where there's a lot of crops and vegetables and everything being grown today. That's a small ahupua called Lihue. Oh, and I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. You, you go look oh. on the tax maps and there it is. Boy, as you see this. This is where Lum Joe had his second mill. And after he closed that or sold that off, he moved to Hilo. And it was up on Amaulu Road. And this mill was a small mill, but it's described quite eloquently by visitors. That's where I shared with you some of the things from Lydgate when he visited this mill and how the fires were being stoked. And um, and how the, I think he said, the most torturous job on the mill was that of Stoker, who kept the fires at burning at an ebullient rate and sweating and cursing like a Turk. These fires were get going so they could boil down the sugar. Well, the Hawaiians called Lum Joe Aiko. And how did Lum Joe become Aiko? You can see it right in the Hawaiianized name. I is eat. And coal is sugar cane. Lam Joe ate a lot of sugar cane in his mill. So I call. <laughs> That's great. So these early plantations from the Chinese side, they were probably 300 acres, maybe 500. They're very small, but there were quite a few of them. Then you you had this Maheli coming around and the businessmen wanting to get land. Then you had the Civil War come on, 1860, 1861 through 65, Civil War. And the South cut off all sugar to the North. You know, there were some um, mills that were formed that were called uh, Civil War mills. And they were, you know, sponsored by the North. And one of them was out there in Pepecao, the Metcalf Mill. There's no evidence of that mill anymore. The transition was growing up towards um, the Reciprocity Treaty. And that's the one where all the sugar that was produced in Hawaii and other goods like pulu and palo and breadfruit and whatever fruits could enter the United States tax-free. And then all of the other crops and flour and cotton and clothes that came from America entered into Hawaii duty-free. That was when you had this big explosion. So small mills, small Chinese mills, then they get into a little bit larger, the American businessmen from the North and the Civil War. And then now you've got the big uh, reciprocity treaty that opened the door for all islands. And you'll see a lot of the mills start about that 1870s, 1880s, because it was better for them uh, to export sugar to the U.S. I think that's fascinating. And also, as an aside, well, a huge aside, that also is what led to plantation owners pushing for annexation by the United States, right? So they can continue with their sugar without being taxed. I mean, it's so interesting to look back and see how one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. Yeah. In our vault at Popeye Co., the Sea Brewer Vault, it's fascinating to see all these records that started from the Maheli and then went through, you know, Kamehameha the third, the fourth, the fifth, Luna Lilo, the Kalakawa, Lilio Kalani, then the overthrow. And and then you you have all of a sudden these documents coming up uh, by Sanford B. Dole, president of the Provisional Government of the Republic of Hawaii. And the Republic of Hawaii was actually the Kingdom of Hawaii that was called now the Republic. Fascinating to see this, this change, all in documents that are kept at the, the Olson archives at Popeye Cone. That is really interesting. Now, tell us how many sugar plantations were there on the island, you know, during these times? It went from what number to what number? On that one map that I shared with you, that was 1937. And I 
counted 15 sugar mills or plantations um, on this island. Oh, but that was not the original start. Um, for example, Kohala sugar was actually four mills that combined to make one. And you would have Hilo sugar that was Hawaii mill plus Kaibiki mill plus Hilo sugar plus Amaulu plantation by Tom Spencer, all combining to make Hilo sugar. I would bet if you look back at the 1920s, there were probably 30 mills and plantation on this island alone. And they slowly started amalgamating and uh, coming together. And where you would have Hakalau, Pepekeo, Onamea, and Hilo sugar, all of those four combined to then make Mauna Kea sugar and one mill. So from small single roller mills with a mule and a, a whip turning the, the the wooden mills, you ended up with giant mills with you know miles and miles of chain and uh, boilers that were the size of rooms. Where when you did a strike, it was tons of sugar at one time being spun off. And a strike means what exactly? A strike is when you're dropping your load of crystallized sugar into the centrifugals. Spins off the molasses and you're left with uh, brown sugar. Tell us about foreign contract laborers being brought in. Uh, 1852. That's when the Chinese laborers were brought in. That's the first immigrant laborers from the uh, Hawaiian Sugar Planters Association. As all these plantations were growing and building they were quite needing more labor and Hawaii just did not have the, the workforce. They had to get more laborers and the Chinese were first and that was then followed by Germans, uh, uh, Europeans, my wife's relatives. They came over in 1883 from Bremen. You don't hear so much about the European worker groups. I mean, maybe the Portuguese, but you, you know, it's not common knowledge that there were Ger Germans or another group that came here. Yeah, skilled labor, stone workers. You see a lot of cut stone, cut native stone around Hilo. Those are Lithuanians. So oh. there were certain groups of imported laborers that were specialized. And, you know, some of them were brought in to be construction workers and, and stone masons, not just laborers out in the field. And so you're talking about by the plantation owners, right? Yeah, the HSPA did all of the importing and the plantations contracted with HSPA to bring laborers over. So they did all the importing and then they would divvy up the workers to each plantation. And, you know, there were, you know, some people that weren't very happy that they were being sent to rainy old Hilo and they wanted to stay on sunny Kauai, but you got sent where you were going to go. And so briefly, just quickly, so what are the different, the, the biggest groups of, of laborers that came? They came from where? Um, Japan, that was the biggest one after the, the Portuguese and then the, the Filipinos after that, which continued continued well into the 1940s and 50s. It's fascinating to me to look at all of these plantation maps that we have from the 1880s and, and moving forward. And on those maps, they all have their camp names. The camps are all around. And a lot of them are racial camps. They kept the Hawaiian camp here and the Puerto Rican camp was over there and the Spanish camp was up there. But what happened was is that all those camps started melding together and they did not have uh, ethnic solidarity. They were starting to intermarry just like the Tong Seas. Each one of them took a Hawaiian wife and uh, some of those wives were, were of royalty. And that's why you see that you know land and power uh, came to them through that. I remember uh, Donald Uchima telling me about some of the baseball and basketball games they would have between the camps on the plantation. And it got rather feisty at times when you had all these people playing games and, and trying to make sure that their Hilo sugar is going to beat Pepe Keo and or, the, or this Puerto Rican camp is going to beat that Japanese camp, but they, they all ended up being melded together, blended into larger and larger camps, and these small ethnic camps disappeared. The only record of them is on an old map. Thank you so much, John, and thanks for tuning in today. Next time, we are going to move on from the history of the sugar plantations to talk with John about the coastline from Hilo to Hakalau specifically and what was happening there during the plantation days. Fascinating stuff. 
Thanks, both of you. And we will be back in two weeks with our next episode with John Cross. Ahui ho!